All right, hello everybody. Welcome to another week of On the Contrary, the show that is unafraid to give you the opinions that the rest of sports media won't give you. Uh, because we are here, we are the brave ones, the courageous ones, doing all we can to take you to the darkest recesses of fantasy football analysis. I'm Chris Fags, joined today by the top DFS player in the world, my boss, one of the owners and founders of Osmo.com, Alex Baker, better known as Osmo. How are you doing, Alex? Doing great. Uh, ready to talk another week of NFL. Uh, I think this one has a lot of exciting games on it compared to previous weeks, so it should be a pretty pretty good show. And uh, back again, thankfully, Roto World Senior Editor, whose matchups column is the most influential one in the industry, in my opinion, Evan Silva. How are you doing, Evan? Yeah, it's good to be back. You need to take a, a week off, a little respite, but um feeling good now feeling refreshed and uh ready to ready to talk some football today before we get into it um i wanted to ask awesome specifically because you had you had a big win uh in nba the other night right yeah um so like can you just kind of take us through that experience you know i i know that you you were you were getting um you know fortunate with like uh some like a bunch of like uh, garbage time late buckets you know are you sitting there watching the game are you watching it like on nba has like i usually play a, a couple of months at nba every year but i can't like remember cuz i'm so focused on football right now but what is it like nba.com has like you know the it, it takes you through the play by play like what are you, are you all focused on that? Or you just kind of like let things fall, set your lineups and let things fall where they may, or what do you do? Uh, I definitely like loading up the league pass, especially the first couple hours of the night. Uh, definitely trying to scout teams that are a little bit more unfamiliar, like something like uh, the Suns where they have a lot of new players this year. So I like watching those games. Uh, also, I try to have a little bit of a social life. I think I can only take a couple hours of watching sports like every day. So I'm not a, a junkie. And uh, I, uh, I guess I haven't been sweating the end of the night, which is big uh, in NBA. But in NFL, I'm around the computer a lot more so I can see a lot more of the games. Yeah, an NBA sweat is a different one. Uh, it, is, it is one that you have to really ride out for the entire night. Uh, and, and in deep into the night, sometimes with those West Coast games. So, yeah, the boss man did it. Congratulations. Uh, thanks for keeping us salaried for another month or two. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. You guys always say that, but I'm sure you know I'm not just like paying the, your salary from my DraftKings bank. <laughs> I, just, I assume you're just like, yeah, it's like hand to mouth. And if you don't win, we're just going to be like, all right, I guess we're not getting paid this week. <laughs> So we're always rooting for you for that reason. Uh, but let's talk about the slate. we got a lot of interesting games. Uh, one thing I want to talk about up front, uh, actually one thing I'll talk about up front is that we do have our promo code contrary right now if you want a free week of Osmo.com, all the ownership projections, articles from Alex and some of our other guys who are really smart, as well as Alex's rankings, which again will help you hopefully take down a GPP or at least get better on uh, moving across the field. So go ahead, sign up now, promo code contrary at Osmo.com. Uh, but first thing we should talk about in those ownership projections, the running backs this week. We have James Conner, Kareem Hunt, and Todd Gurley all projected for above 25% ownership. They're all in good spots. They've all been rolling. Uh, Alex, rank those three guys, but also tell me, how do you handle three elite backs being so highly owned in a tournament? So I think there are a lot of great plays at running back this week. So you can, you can really pick and choose whatever ones you want. I think you'll be fine. Uh, Todd Gurley, I think uh, he was a little bit overowned last week in my estimation. This week, I think uh, the matchup's pretty good. Uh, the ownership's a little bit lower, so I'm more on that. Uh, more, I'd go down a little bit farther in the ownership for my next guy. So I like Saquon Barkley a lot. I think uh, he gets as many yards as anybody else in the league on a week-to-week -week basis. So I'd be really interested in him uh, as a spend up to be contrary in action. Uh, Evan, what do you think about the prospects of those three guys this week, of uh, Connor, Gurley, and uh, Kareem Hunt? Yeah, I mean, I think the prospects for Todd Gurley always look really, really good. You know, he's a big home favorite, two-score home favorite uh, against Green Bay. Um, you know, 
especially with Cooper Cup out because he gets so much scoring posi- position usage, it really uh, more more so incentivizes the Rams to feed Todd Gurley in scoring position. Uh, so I like that uh, in that game. James Conner, you know, uh, again, a big home favorite against Cleveland. The Browns have struggled against the run. Same with uh, the Chiefs, uh, two-score home favorite against the Broncos. And uh, the Broncos have not been great against the run. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Kareem Hunt, too, the one thing I worry about with him is obviously he had that big game versus Denver. Um, you know, and people are going to chase those points a little bit. Kareem Hunt also coming off of two huge games. Uh, that scares me a little, but I think it's hard to fade these guys this week, uh, though I do have one running back who I think we'll talk about. And I actually want to get, you know, let's talk about him now. Uh, Evan, Evan Selva, you're a guy who knows all these things. You know the coaches, you know the things, how things break down, how they could be affected. Uh, Mike McCoy being fired in Arizona, to me, seems like this is what we've been waiting for for David Johnson. Uh, just mm-hmm. to have a, another coach in there who will figure out how to use it more creatively. Obviously, Byron Leftwich, the guy, played in spread offenses. He's been under Bruce Arians, has been tutored by him for years. What do you think that does to affect David Johnson and his prospects? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say because, you know, he 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 does have the extra couple of days because they played in the Thursday night game um, to, you know, make tweaks to the offense. Byron Leftwich, of course, was uh, a backup quarterback in Pittsburgh under Bruce Arians. Uh, was there during Ben Roethlisberger's uh, suspension, uh, along with Charlie Batch. Um, you know, Bruce Arians loves, loved him, took him under his wing, hired him as a coaching intern in 2016 with the Cardinals. He quickly ascended to quarterback's coach, and now he's in the OC chair. Um, you know, I, I think that the goal it should be, you know, assuming rational coaching to – get the ball to David Johnson on the edges. You know, you go back and watch his, his games at uh, Northern Iowa even, and he, you know, he was a converted wide receiver. He, he was never like a re- truly natural, great inside runner. Like Ezekiel Elliott is a much better inside runner than him, but he's much better on the edges and as a receiver than Ezekiel Elliott is, you know? So, and, and with Mike McCoy, like he was just banging him into the back of, of the, the guards and centers, you know, and, now, hopefully, we can get Byron Leftwich to get him out on the edges uh, more. Now, that's that can be easier said than done. They just don't have a lot of talent on their offense. I mean, that that really is, you know, it, just as, as big of a problem uh, as anything, probably the biggest problem. Uh, but the fact that, you know, just everyone was even playing at or below expectation under the old OC, you know, that was why the OC needed to go and why they needed to go in a different direction. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think that we can have a level of hope. The touches have been there. I mean, he's been getting, you know, good workloads. It looks like they're, they're going to be without Mike Upati again, their stud left guard. Um, I don't know. I, one thing I wanted to say about, uh, James Conner, um, and I, I said it on like three different podcasts this week. So I, I first, my first inclination was to uh, avoid it, but I'm going to say it anyways. So the, the Steeler or the Browns have played the most defensive snaps of any team in the NFL by 34. They've played four games in overtime. Last week, their defense was on the field for 95 snaps. Okay, that is 25 to 30 more than uh, an average team would play. And now they are going on the road to Pittsburgh, who historically crushes at home, you, you know, Ben with the, the home splits. And – um, is coming off its buy. So these teams are like, you know, kind of rested off its buy. So these teams are like at totally opposite ends of the spectrum. And I, I you know, you, you go back to like the, those Eagles defenses under Chip Kelly, where they would be on the field so much. And by the end of the season, they just totally ran out of gas. And we're not to the end of the season yet, but we're, we're definitely, you know, we're at the halfway point. And I mean, this team has, this defense has just been out there so much. Um, I think it's going to begin to catch up with them. I, I think that the Steelers like might like smash the Browns this week. Yeah, I actually think so too. And the Steelers on defense are one of my favorite plays of the week too, especially on DraftKings where they're very cheap. And Baker was just rattled by the the blitzes that uh, Duffner was bringing last week for the Bucks. And obviously, I think Pittsburgh is going to see that and key in on that immediately. I think Baker is also one of the worst ratings under pressure. But Evan, you probably know that better than I do. Um, but yeah, I think overall uh, Baker yeah. Baker worst yeah. in the NFL against the blitz. There you go. So, yeah. And he looked at last week like I was watching that game and I had a fair amount of Browns. I was all over the rat man, Damian Ratley and many of my lineups. 
and uh, as people on this stream will know. And uh, yeah, but Baker looked bad because he just kept sending heat after him time and time again, and Baker couldn't adjust, and obviously Hugh and, and company couldn't adjust either, and ugh, it got ugly fast for Baker. And, and the Steelers are not necessarily a high percentage blitz team, but they do have these games where they will just like their blitz percentage will just spike, you know, a, a, like a, as a, an opponent specific game plan. Uh, and it just would make a lot of sense for, for them to uh, attack the Browns in that manner. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the one guy, though, I do like, and while we're talking about this game, the one guy I do like on the Cleveland side would be David and Joku. Uh, Pittsburgh has been very bad versus the tight end on Football Outsiders DVOA. Uh, they've been giving up a 20.5% boost to tight ends. And Joku, to me, seems like the guy who, if, he, if they are getting blitzed and hammered a lot, he should pick up some immediate um, area targets that will help him out a bit. Uh, Alex, what do you think about this Cleveland Pittsburgh game overall? It's not my favorite game on the slate, but. James Conner, I have projected for a pretty sizable total. Price looks good. He's not my favorite play just because he is so popular and there are other comparable running backs at a lower ownership that I think have just as good a shot at, as him. So overall, I think the game is a little bit too popular for me to go to this week. At least that's where I'm at right now. Is, is Ben to AB supposed to be popular? Uh, ben to AB, we have Ben at about 9% ownership on DraftKings right now and AB at about 13%. So not okay. super popular, but popular enough where maybe you want to avoid it. What about Vance McDonald? Where do you have him projected for a percentage? Vance under 7%. Okay. Interesting. So Yeah. Not, not bad for a tight end, but yeah, it, there's a lot of ownership here. Uh, pretty much the only guy not owned at all on the Pittsburgh side would be James Washington. And he just does it. He's just out there running around like a kid in Little League in the outfield. <laughs> it's not, not my favorite dude but alex give us a spot then since, since uh, cleveland pittsburgh is not one for you give me an under the radar spot that you're looking at this week under the radar okay i was thinking of kansas city we'll get there eventually yeah, that's definitely <laughs> very under the radar under the nobody radar. talking about them at all <laughs> <laughs> one game i'm looking at is washington at the giants it's one of the lower totals on the week but this is all of a contingent on injury information because the Redskins could be a really good play this week or they could be a bad play depending on who's playing. So right now, Chris Thompson and Paul Richardson are both questionable. I'm not really confident one way or the other whether they're going to play this week or not. If they don't, I feel like Adrian Peterson is a pretty good play. He got an absurd number of touches last week. And guys like Alex Smith, Jordan Reed, uh, Maurice Harris, I think they're all in play as well, uh, just because the ownership is going to be so low. It's not that they're outstanding plays, but they're just that under the radar, I guess. Uh, as you, you love Alex Smith. You have, you have been flirting with Alex Smith for weeks, and you're, <laughs> I'm terrified of this Redskins offense. They look so bad. I don't know. It freaks me out. But, Evan, what do you think? you be the tiebreaker. Um, yeah, I – this Redskins offense um, has not been well, like one thing that John, Jay Gruden has really stressed is that they want to be a run the ball and stop the run team. So that's not great for fantasy, number one. Um, and that has been, you know, he has like demonstrated that put that into action with their play calling. Um, like last week, they really sold out to stop Ezekiel Elliott. I mean, they used in combination with their base defense, they used three safeties on the field, you know, like a, a big, like a, like a plus size package. Uh, you know, they went out, this is the second year in a row that they drafted a defensive lineman in the first round, Deron Payne to go with uh, Jonathan Allen, both out of uh, Alabama. And they were able to stop the run and they, they really had good uh, run defense efficiency marks uh, against the saints and, uh, and they also, although Mark Ingram did uh, score twice, uh, but they also had really good run defense efficiency marks against the Panthers. So this is three weeks in a row facing good rushing offenses where they shut down the run. Um, so that has become a focus for them. And that's not to say that Saquon Barkley can't have a big game. What you really want for him, you know, is to get a, catch a bunch of passes and break, you know, break, uh, you know, big, big gains in the receiving game. But that's it seems to be their philosophy on both offense and defense. And that, like Osimo uh, mentioned, does bode well for Adrian Peterson. I tend to think, based on 
just reading the beat writers throughout the week that they expect Chris Thompson to be back and Paul Richardson to be back, but, you know, not, not guarantees. I mean, this has not been a particularly predictable uh, injury report week to week for the Redskins in general. Um, and Jordan Reed has just been, I mean, a, a letdown every week. Like I've, I've kind of liked them every week and man, he, he's just not coming through and it's a combination of their, their commitment to the run and Alex Smith, you know, just not really producing. I mean, he, he's not finished as a top 12 fantasy quarterback in a single game uh, in a single week th- through six games so far this year. That's tough. Yeah. Alex Smith has just not been there this year. And it's sad to see him after he had that, like such an elite start to last year. Uh, the Peterson call makes sense, but Alex, what do you think about Saquon on the other side? Cause he is the lone, I guess, high price guy who's not gonna have a ton of ownership. We have him at under 9% right now. Uh, is he a guy you'd have interest to? Cause he seems like one of those pay ups to be contrarian in a, in a minus matchup, but it is a tough matchup. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking is that it's just an ownership play where everyone's going to be on a guy like Gurley. Saquon Barkley's team isn't nearly as good, so there's not going to be as many touchdown chances for him, which is a big knock against him versus Gurley. But he just receives a ton of passes, gets a ton of rushes. So all in all, that's pretty good for his potential this week. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Like, you definitely see Saquon. He's been good in, in minus matchups before, and he's just such an elite talent. Those, those thighs, those thighs just get him fucking everywhere he needs to go. So I, I think Saquon's interesting if he's going to be under 10% owned. Um, let's talk about another game, which is people are projecting to shoot out. Tampa Bay heading into Cincinnati. Uh, some decent ownership on both sides. A less ownership projected for Tampa Bay than I would expect. Uh, but, Alex, what do you think about this from a DFS standpoint? This is a game that's definitely on my radar. Uh, Andy Dalton, I believe, is going to be one of the more popular quarterbacks this week, and he has the weapons to really make a stack work with A.J. Green and Tyler Boyd. And one of my favorite plays of the week is Joe Mixon. He gets a ton of passes and rush attempts, and that's always great for fantasy. Team total's high. The prices are pretty reasonable, so I think – especially on Cincinnati's side. I really like this game. Evan, how do you see this one happening or breaking down? Yeah, Mixon is, uh, becomes even more intriguing because uh, I think that his ownership is going to be down. And, uh, you know, you, you can tell me what his percentage is projected at. But I, my guess is that just based on the, the recent game log watchers, his, uh, his percentage is going to be down because in the week six game, he kind of got banged up. A little bit in the game not like a serious injury but he came out for you know a, a select number of snaps and you know wound up getting below his, his uh, projected number of touches and then last week I mean they just got smashed you know I mean and that happens sometimes you know especially on the road at Arrowhead um, now they return home as favorites um, no Giovanni Bernard again uh, the Buccaneers are missing Gerald McCoy Vinnie Curry and Quan Alexander in their front seven, three critical players in their front seven. Um, and, you know, the passing game just hasn't been as good recently without Tyler Eifert and John Ross is back on the shelf. You know, they just don't have as many weapons as they did before. Uh, so I, I'm totally with you on on Joe Mixon. What, where do you have him projected in terms of ownership? We've got him at about 15% right now. So not bad. We can roll it to the other guys, but still some decent following. Yeah, actually, everybody on the Cincinnati side, we have above 10% besides Dalton, who is just a shade beneath him, uh, but much less on the Tampa Bay side. And that's why I'd be a little more intrigued there. Um, I'll spoil it now. One of my contrarian wide receiver picks based on our ownership projections is on the Tampa Bay side. I think Deshaun Jackson under 5% in this matchup seems like a, a big time error to me. Cincinnati giving up 430 yards per game. I don't think they could defend the deep ball particularly well. And Deshaun has been quiet for a couple weeks. I, I think Deshaun looks great. I think Jameis looks great. Uh, stupid Peyton Barber <laughs> is, I think, an interesting play as well. Um, but this seems like the most stackable game to be on both sides. I think there's a lot of good plays on, on both. Uh, Alex, what do you think about the, the Tampa Bay side heading into Cincinnati? They haven't been on my radar quite as much. Really? Uh, I'm, I haven't looked that closely at the salaries, but I'm guessing it's just kind of a salary thing because Mike Evans I uh, projected to do pretty well. Uh, and Jameis Winston. I, I guess it's also hard to make a stack because the only real stack you can make is Winston, Jackson, and Evans. There aren't really any other great options on the team 
uh, in my projections. Uh, Evan, how do you feel about the Tampa Bay side? Yeah, um, I do like OJ Howard um, against, uh, especially against the Bengals linebackers. The Bengals, th this I think this game, you know, the like the shootout potential of this game, and I'm, I'm looking right now. Uh, yeah, the over has been hit in in this game. It's uh, it opened at 53 and a half. It's up to 54 and a half in most spots, and 55 uh, at, at uh, one particular book that's considered uh, respectable. So the over is already kind of you know a popular play, or at least the the money has moved to the over. And um, not only you know on Tampa Bay side are, are there the injuries that that are mentioned in regard to Joe Mixon, but on Cincinnati side, they're going to be without their two best linebackers, Vontez Perfect and Nick Vigil. Um, and then they're without their slot corner, Darquez Denard. So they are also pretty significantly shorthanded, although Vontez Perfect has been trashed this year. Um, but Nick Vigil has, had been good early in the season. Um, so, you know, I, I think that this game can definitely, you know, go over the total and, and uh, exceed expectations. It, it is hard to because of there are so many options in the Tampa Bay passing game, it's really hard to put your finger on who is going to have a monster game. And sometimes even when Jameis has a monster game, like no dude in the passing game in, in the pass catcher core has a monster game. We actually saw that uh, in Jameis's first start after the bye. Um, Adam Humphreys like had, had 82 yards and led the team in, in receiving yards. And I think Deshaun Jackson was seven, had 77 and he was second on the team and, you know, lower down the, the game log, like OJ Howard scored a touchdown, you know, with 67 yards. And it's just, it, it can get spread out. Mike Evans did have a good game last week, although he didn't score a touchdown, you know, but there's just so many dudes in the passing game that it can be hard to really single out uh, exactly who's going to have a big game in a particular week. Interesting. Alex, I guess this is a question for you then. Um, would you, would you play, would you play a, I hate this phrase, but I know it's like the one to use. Would you play a naked Jameis Winston uh, without anybody stacked with him in, in a lineup then if, if we do think that the passing concentration won't really be funneled to one guy or, or two guys in particular? I think that correlation is a very important part of any lineup in DFS. Uh, with football, it's very important uh, because when a quarterback exceeds their expectation, that means several of the players on, his, on their team, on his team, must also exceed their production for that to even be possible. So I think it is smart to stack it up. I'm not saying that it's impossible to win if you don't, but you have to make up for it by having a higher overall projection in your lineup or by being more contrary. Interesting. Okay. How often do you feel like you don't stack a quarterback with one of his targets? I haven't done that at all this year. The only time I would really do that is if I was trying to play a quarterback that just runs the ball a ton. I don't Got think it. anyone really fits the bill. Maybe Cam Newton it would be one I'd consider, but I wouldn't be crazy about that either. Or, or fleet-footed Mitch Trubisky, that guy. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> Just I running have... across the field, looking like Matt and Mike Vick out there. That was hilarious. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think it's interesting. I, I feel like you just dispelled one of the major DFS things that people talk about in a lot of shows, and we just had it as a throwaway thing in there. But yeah, that <laughs> is a big one to say that uh, it's not ideal to play a, a naked Jameis Winston. You don't want Jameis Winston naked in your life, especially if you're a female Uber driver or just a female. Oh, specs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sorry. I, I had to do that. Knew that, I had to do that. that was barstool spags right there <laughs> that is that was just you know look that's a sports take that's a totally fair sports take <laughs> not a great dude and not a dude you want naked i'll stand on that i'll stand on that hill uh <laughs> let's talk about a guy who i feel like doesn't have a ton of ownership but this matchup seems super appealing to me indianapolis and oakland uh andrew luck who's been passing 45 times a game almost going against the team giving up the most yards per pass uh at least on the slate i think might be in the league uh, with 8.7 yards per pass and 9.6 air yards per target i love andrew luck this week and i think if people are going to go to Goff or, or rogers i'll happily just sit there with luck and hope he just picks apart the raiders uh what do you think about this from a matchup perspective evan yeah the first thing that stands out to me is that, uh, about andrew luck is that i think he's going to have a clean pocket all game and ideally I want my quarterbacks to be in clean pockets and I'm like Andrew uh, Aaron Rodgers is my favorite uh, tournament play. And I think I'm going to play him in cash even this week on FanDuel. Um, 
And the one concern that I have about him is that he may be under pressure. Uh, but with Andrew Luck, you really don't have that risk. He's gone 125 straight pass attempts without taking a sack. They have fixed their offensive line. Uh, the Raiders have the worst pass rush in the league. Um, so I think that Andrew Luck really checks that box. And he's getting back uh, T.Y. Hilton uh, as uh, more of a full-time player. He was, he was back last week, caught a couple of short touchdowns, but only played 53% of the snaps. But he should be in uh, the, as a full-time player this week. Uh, and Jack Doyle, it looks like they're going to get back uh, from – a hip injury he was removed from the injury report so uh that's very very likely that, that he plays almost a certainty um so I, I really really like Andrew Luck I mean 15 touchdown passes over his last four games their pass attempts have started to creep down a little bit because they have a good running game though uh Marlon Mack has been on a tear the last two weeks they're uh, according to football outsiders in their adjusted line yards for in terms of run blocking they're the number five run blocking team in the NFL, you just the, the offensive line has been fixed. I mean, I, I think, and we're we're still in a small sample, and I guess it could go south, you know, in, in within two weeks. But based on the way that they have played, their their hit percentage allowed and their run blocking, I mean, the offensive line looks like one of the best in the league. All of a sudden, they looked really good versus Buffalo, and I was kind of surprised that Buffalo has been pretty aggressive getting after quarterbacks, and they just they could not even get close to Andrew Luck last week. Um, so yeah, I think that's an interesting uh, angle there. Alex, how do you view this game? Obviously, there's a lot of there should be a lot of value on the Oakland side, at least theoretically. Uh, Jordy Nelson, we talked about before we started the show, but expect to be one of the chalkier wide receivers on the slate, which you definitely want to have with a an aging an aging wide receiver who doesn't get separation. Uh, but what are you doing on this game, Alex? And, and do you see any value on the Oakland side? Yeah, definitely. Oakland is going to be one of the most popular value teams with the trade of Amari Cooper that frees up a lot of targets. And I'm expecting a lot of those targets to actually go to Martavis Bryant instead of Jordy Nelson. Hmm. Jordy Nelson, he's he's played about twice as many snaps, a little bit more than twice as many snaps as Martavis Bryant. And he's only gotten, uh, Martavis Bryant's gotten about two thirds of the targets of him. So what I'm expecting to happen is Bryant to get a lot more snaps this week and be targeted at a higher clip than Nelson. And when the ownership is lower as well, that's kind of all building this uh, case to pick Bryant as a GPP play, uh, either as a one-off or part of a game stack here. Uh, Evan, how do you think this Oakland offense shakes out? Obviously, they're, they're losing Marshawn Lynch to IR. Uh, they've traded away Amari Cooper, and I'm sure that's going to be a great pick for my Dallas Cowboys. Not at all a waste of a first rounder. Um, but this Oakland offense does seem like it should have some potential there. How do you feel like that's going to turn out? Uh, yeah, I tend to agree with uh, Awesome Mo uh, about the um, like that Martavis Bryant could, can be the biggest beneficiary here uh, in the Oakland passing game. He is. Uh, Amari Cooper was leading that the team in air yards um, and Martavis Bryant was like a pretty close second, despite having like 10 fewer targets. Um, and in, in the last game uh, against Seattle before the bye, Martavis Bryant snaps and his routes run were season highs. And they're kind of like incentivized to make him work because they traded this third round pick for him and just a, a terrible real life NFL trade. Um, but they're kind of like incentivized to make him work. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the negatives here are that, you know, Derek Carr is not, um, you know, an aggressive downfield passer and the Colts have actually been kind of good at defending, um, passes down the football field, uh, playing a lot of zone defense. Uh, but you know, with, with his usage way up, uh, and with his, with the team incentivized to, uh, want to make him work. And with his big playability and his cheap cost in, in daily fantasy, I mean, he's squarely, squarely in play as a tournament option. What, what is his price? Can you even use him in cash? We talked about this on the Swole cast on Friday, uh, and, and Tuttle was talking about maybe even using him in cash on DK. What do you think, Alex? Would you use him in cash? Oh, yeah. He, point per dollar, he, he's one of the best plays on the slate, I think, uh, just because his price hasn't risen to his new role. Do we have no concerns at all? And this might be more of an Evan thing. I assume Alex won't, but 
do you know concerns at all about the disharmony in that locker room? There's an athletic piece about Derek Carr that, that went viral because pro football talk like kind of made it really shitty for Derek Carr and sound like an asshole where he's like compared to a child crying after falling off his bike. And there's a lot of bad juju around that Raiders organization right now. Is that something that you would factor in at all to mitigate some interest in these guys? I, I do. Or Evan? Oh, 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 sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. No, go, um, go ahead, Evan. Sorry, I'm just, I shouldn't have prompted. I should just let you guys go. <laughs> no, um, I think that, you know, I think that the, the, the roster may feel like sort of abandoned by the coaching staff um, and they may kind of uh, want to like start to play for themselves. I mean, Derek Carr is a lot of, a lot of, a lot of pride, dude. You know, I mean, he's, I mean, I, I think that these team, these, this, the players are, are going to, I mean, I don't know if they're going to, you know, necessarily win the game, although it wouldn't surprise me if they did. Um, I just, I think that with them trading away these kind of like, you know, mainstays, young players, I think that the the team could could easily rally back uh, from that as opposed to just getting downtrodden. Alex, what do you think about that stuff? I mean, that's obviously narrative, narrative, not data, but there's a lot of bad narrative. Well, I'm kind of confused because the last tweet I saw from Derek Carr was all about touting how he was a Raider and, uh, I thought that was some leadership. Am I not on uh, the right track here? No, I mean, you know, if you want to read that tweet more, but I I feel like whenever you see like a hit piece come out and to me, and I think some of the people who were smart on Twitter that I saw speculated that might've been a hit piece planted by the the Raiders organization because the information and the way they spoke about the whole team and and certain things. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like for football, if a team is, is unmotivated in some way and they're going against a team who's been crushing, it does seem like a spot where like they could rally. They could, you know, be the troops in the bunker who were left behind, or they could just wilt and just be like, we're done. This is our year's over. Let's go to Cancun. <laughs> I think the main thing here is just that the absence of Marshawn Lynch and Amari Cooper is going to create a lot of opportunity for players. And what we're looking for is good value. These guys aren't blocks by any means, but the price is – Oh, at a good level compared to their opportunity. So another guy I might look at is Doug Martin. I haven't dug into it a ton yet, but uh, I'm guessing he's really cheap and is going to get the rock a lot. So that could be a good play too. Yeah, yeah you, you, pull, you, you, you pull Amari and Marshawn Lynch out of the Raiders offense. And I mean, that's nine targets per game. You know, it's 8.7 targets per game. And you know, so that, that creates like a significant amount of opportunity for the rest of the passing game. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And Jalen Richard, too, is worth pointing out. Uh, we currently have a projected for 12% ownership. That could trickle upwards or downwards a little, but he has been catching a lot of passes, getting targeted a fair amount, including in that London game. And uh, Seth Roberts, too, I think is also worth pointing out. He has been kind of a, a, a apple of the eye for Derek Carr in the past. And I think um, the one guy who has more tenure with Carr and has been there for a few years. So maybe, you know, a little more reliance on him this week, but. Um, but yeah, I think that all makes sense to me. Uh, Alex, you wanted to talk about Pat Mahomes going against Denver. Let's talk about it. What do you think about that game? So I think Mahomes, any week that he's on the slate, he's probably going to be the top projected quarterback. And I don't think this week's a lot different. And I'm also seeing a good option on the other side of the game. Uh, obviously in Kansas City, I guess Hunt, Kelsey, Hill, uh, Watkins, they're all in play. But Denver, I'm kind of interested with Royce Freeman out. Their running back situation had been kind of a timeshare. And when one of the three is out, that's creating a lot more usage for the other players. So I think that Philip Lindsay could be a good play uh, this week. What do you think about uh, his prospects, Evan? Yeah, I mean, I really, really like him, man. He's a really explosive little player. Um their run blocking has actually been pretty good and the chiefs have just been really bad against the run and they've given up the most receiving yards in the NFL uh, to opposing running backs. And you pull Royce Freeman out of the picture. Uh, it, it greatly increases the probability that Philip Lindsay, like if they get into scoring position, Philip Lindsay is going to be getting those carries. Um, and it gives them a shot at like 20 touches. You know, it gives them a chance to get 20 touches. I think we will see more Devonte Booker and Hey, if they fall behind, that, that's your risk with Philip Lindsay. If they fall behind and like Devontae Booker winds up playing half the game because they trust him in pass protection and, you know, they don't really try to get him the ball when he's out there, but like he can end up playing a lot of snaps. That's where the risk comes in. 
But man, I, I love the upside of Philip Lindsay. I love the matchup. I love the, you know, the usage bump that we can anticipate with no, no with no Royce Freeman. Um, I like the way that their, their offensive line run blocks. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I love Philip Lindsay to play this week. Yeah, Lindsay looks great to me too. And I think for all the reasons you guys both outlined, uh, I'm actually intrigued a little in maybe game stacking here, but going into a case Keenum, very, very cheap, under 3% ownership right now, projected on DraftKings. Uh, his targets as well, Sanders at 8%, uh, Demarius Thomas under 7%, Cortland Sutton even under 5%. I think something here can go down just because they're going to have to do something to, to get points on their side. Um, and Kansas City too, I think it's interesting to note, uh, Patrick Mahomes, Kareem Hunt, and Travis Kelsey expect to be very highly owned for their positions. But Tyreek Hill and Sammy Watkins in particular at uh, under 5,000 on DraftKings, both projected for just 8% ownership. And obviously with this game, expected to have 32 points by Las Vegas. Uh, there's some value there, despite this being a game that people will highly target. Um, let's talk about the what should be the, the showcase game in the afternoon. Uh, we have the Packers coming into L.A. going against the Rams. Uh, Evan, how do you see this one breaking down? Aaron Rodgers obviously is, is a guy who's going to throw it up a ton here, and he's going to need yeah. to. Uh, how do you see this one ending up? Yeah, just love everyone, you know. Um, <laughs> Love the uh, the Rodgers to Adams. I think that Rodgers to Graham uh, could be overlooked a little bit. I thought that Jimmy Graham, just from watching him play in the first six games, looked tremendous in terms of his athleticism. That did not he did not always look that way in Seattle, you know, especially after tearing his uh, patellar tendon. But I think that he's he's in a good place. People think that he's really really old, but he's only like thirty one or thirty two. Uh, so he's not he's not you know entirely over the hill yet. Um, you know, the, the Rogers to, I, I, I love those stacks as, as for like the complimentary pass catchers. I just really don't know. You know, I think that they should play Marquez Valdez scantling a lot, but Randall Cobb was full practice on Friday and Geronimo Allison isn't even on the injury report again. And, you know, a lot of times these teams will just defer to the veterans, throw them right back in. And so I, it's hard for me to get a little handle on, you know, exactly how the playing time is going to go. I think that and if you were going to rank them in terms of plays for week eight, it'd be Allison and then Cobb and then Marcus Valdez scampling, unfortunately. Um, on the other side, I mean, I don't, there's not a whole lot that else needs to be said about Todd Gurley. Um, you know, I think that Brandon Cooks has the best matchup uh, in the Rams pass catcher core against these big Packers outside corners. I think that they're going to have a, a tough time dealing with his speed and quickness. Um, you know, Robert Woods is always a really strong play, but I think that this stands out as a Brandon Cooks week. And a Robert Woods also projected for significantly more ownership than Brandon Cooks, so that that immediately jumps out as a nice leverage spot. Uh, he's also a hundred dollars more expensive on DraftKings, um, and that could be yeah, that could be actually very interesting. Then good to know, Evan. Thank you, uh, Alex. What do you think about this game? I think the Green Bay is kind of tough to target with Cobb and Allison uh, coming back. I think that kind of reduces the value of Devontae Adams a little bit. Matchup isn't great. Um, Devontae Adams still would be uh, the player I targeted in a game stack here. The problem is the price is pretty high. Uh, and then on the Rams, I think that obviously Gurley, great play uh, if you have the salary. And then Woods and Cooks, those are very highly projected. but. Uh, with the popularity of the game and uh, the fact that it's kind of hard to get a good play from Green Bay, in my estimation, I'm not going to be stacking this game up quite as much uh, as some other ones. Interesting. Uh, uh, Evan, one, one last question about the Green Bay side. Sad, man. Makes me sad. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree too. I think it's, I get the ownership play there, but now that Cook's being under owned, and then I think Allison and Cobb you get for low ownership. Um, I think it's noteworthy. But one question, Evan, I want to ask you, because I think there was an article I saw in whatever Gannett uh, Packers beat that they have, uh, the USA Today company, they have some Packers website, which was well reported. There was an interview with Mike McCarthy talking about how he wants to run more, but they didn't really ask questions about Aaron Jones in particular. Do you think Aaron Jones is ever going to get the run that he deserves? He's been the most uh, efficient back by far. He's broken more runs. I feel like you've been active talking about him on Twitter here and there. Uh, what do you think about that running back situation? Yeah, I mean, I, I really like him, you know, but unfortunately they're committed to a three-man backfield and he has never even, he's played 16 games in the NFL, has never gotten to 20 receiving yards in, in an NFL game. Um, you know, they don't really throw to him in the passing game. 
Uh, they don't really throw to their backs in general in the passing game, actually. Um, and that has, that's, you know, I think that that's largely a product of how aggressive throwing the football down the field Aaron Rodgers is, you know, he's not looking to dump the ball off. Like he's looking to chuck it down field. Um, Cause he's, you know, he believes in himself as he should. Um, so I, and I think that they may fall behind in this game. They may experience negative game script and that's not good for the running game. So I think it's going to be, you know, in their last game when they did, when they fell behind and then they kind of rallied back to win against San Francisco uh, before the bye. You know, Aaron, Aaron Jones had eight touches and played the fewest snaps in the backfield. So, man, I just the floor is too low, I think, you know, and I don't even think that there's enough upside. You know, he's going to have to bang like one or two long runs to, to really help you because he's not going to be getting catches. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I It, it hurts, but it, you keep wanting Aaron Jones to get in there and all the smart people seem to be pushing Aaron Jones as a guy who deserves more but. Mike McCarthy just refuses to listen, even to his own quarterback. Um, let's talk about defenses. I know defense, there's a degree of randomness, but there is one defense to me that jumps off uh, the page, and they are the highest-priced defense, I believe, on both sides, the Chicago Bears. Uh, going against Sam Darnold at home, Darnold obviously been turnover-prone, been sacked a fair amount. Chicago uh, been reeling a little bit the last few weeks. Evan, is there anything you see with the Chicago, the Chicago defense that's worrisome there? I think they've given up some decent quarterback games recently as well. Yeah, I mean, they played a game in 100-degree Miami heat two weeks ago, which, you know, if you've been in the Chicago area recently, it's not anywhere close to 100 degrees here. <laughs> um, you know, so that's like way out of their element. And, it, and the game went to overtime. Um, and they gave up like check down long touchdowns to Albert Wilson. Um, and, they, and they gave up a big run in overtime to Frank Gore, like a 32-yard run. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think that the Packers, ha the Bears have a much better defense. Than they, and then they played Tom Brady, um, mm -hmm. you know, with, with a full uh, assortment uh, of weapons. Although, I guess they, they didn't have Gronk, did they? No, they did not have Gronk. Yeah. But they have Josh but, Gordon. Yeah, still enough weapons. They'll, they they'll have be Josh greedy. Gordon. <laughs> right, right. They have so many weapons. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, but – I think this is a get right spot for the, the, for the bears defense, especially against, you know, Sam Darnold He's thrown the most interceptions in the NFL. Their offensive line isn't very good. Um, you know, their receiver core is just so abysmal. I mean, it is abysmal. They, they're, th they're week one, three receiver set. None of those guys are there this week. Robbie Anderson out with a high ankle sprain. Uh, uh, Quincy Nunwa out with a high ankle sprain. Terrell Pryor had a groin injury, got cut. Those were their – that was their three receiver set in week one. None of those guys are going to be playing this week. So they're going to be playing with Jermaine Curse, you know, week seven goose egg Jermaine Curse. Um, they're going to be playing with Sharon Peak, who last week dropped the pass and it, you know, uh, flies in there and a, a defender catches it. Uh, I mean, Sharon Peak just can't catch. Andre Roberts runs a bad route, gets Darnold intercepted. Um, you know, that, that's two interceptions right there that of uh, what Sam Darnold threw last week. And, um, you know, they're signing dudes off the street, Richard Matthews. I mean, it's, it's a disaster in terms of their pass catcher core. I think that uh, uh, an interesting guy, and I think he started to, to generate some, some later week buzz, is Trenton Cannon, uh, the Jets' number two back this week. Uh, they ran plays for him early in the game. Last week, he beat uh, Eric Kendricks, the Vikings middle linebacker, for on a thir for a 35-yard gain on a wheel route. Um, he wound up leading the team in receiving. And if they fall behind, I think he's going to be on the on the field a lot. And, and, you know, they will pull Isaiah Crowell off the field. Yeah, uh, Cannon is, ha does have some hype on him. Ownership-wise, they're not much there, just 1% ownership projected for him. And I think the game script could go his way. Uh, I think that does that's a pretty smart call there, Evan. Uh, Alex, let's talk about the the Bears a little more because they are the highest priced defense. Obviously, defense being so random, I'm going to assume you're not going to be on their side. But what do you think about them going against the Jets, Alex? Yeah, I think they're one of the best defenses this week, but the price is kind of up, out of proportion compared to some of the other teams. The problem with defense is that the big scores tend to happen from sacks and interceptions turning into touchdowns and the frequency of that isn't that high and uh for that reason it can be a good idea to avoid like highly owned defenses so i think uh, it's good to spread it around chicago the problem is the ownership it looks like it's going to be kind of high and the value isn't that great either 
so one uh, defense I'm looking at uh, is the Cardinals. I think uh, versus San Francisco. Uh, they, that game has one of the lowest totals on the board, so I think you can go to either side. On one of the sides, the Cardinals are going to be pretty popular, but on the other, I think uh, on DraftKings, the Steelers just have the lion's share of ownership and every other team is kind of low. So I think on DraftKings, I like the Cardinals. On FanDuel, I, uh, I also like them, but the ownership is a little bit higher. Uh, and since you are the Trubisky whisperer, I feel like we should address real fast. Cause I think I saw this actually, Evan, in your column, Trubisky's had a lot of QB one finishes that were strong over the past few weeks and people still are not playing him, uh, projected under 5% ownership here, even though the Jets defense has been, I mean, they've been steady, but they've given up some big games. Uh, do you see any value in going with the bears offense at all, Alex? Yeah, I did notice Trubisky is sprinkled through my lineups in my first crunches here. Uh, as one of the top options. Well, not the top, but playable, I suppose. And the reason why is Tariq Cohen is getting a ton of passing out of the backfield. And I think he's a pretty good play. The problem is the rest of the offense is kind of spread out between Gabriel, Robinson, and Burton. So it's pretty tough to find a good value in one of those guys. So that's why it's not my favorite play, but I think it is playable. Yeah, and, and even, any- even last week, Anthony Miller had seven targets and led the team in air yards. You know, he's like coming back from the shoulder injury. They they do have a lot of a lot of dudes in that supporting cast. Do you, do you find any value in this offensive side? And also, will we ever have a Jordan Howard breakout game? I think that's that's what I want to know. He's priced. He's very cheap, and he's tempting every week, but he's, he's kind of sucked and not been used well. Right, right. I mean, I think that this would be this game really sets up well for him. You know, I, I don't think that I'm going to play him because it just it just feels gross. You know. But uh, I think that if you're going to – and I'm going to obviously have to play him in season long. But, you know, in DFS, like, he just – you need to get, like, multiple touchdowns, you know, because he's not going to catch passes. I mean, every week his number of routes run goes down. You know, he's not getting targets. You you absolutely have to get multiple touchdowns from him. And, you know, that's that's difficult, you know. I mean, last week he had one touchdown. He almost had two. Uh, but it, it, the second one was called was called back, so he kind of almost got there last week. But uh, I mean, I do think from a game script standpoint, this is, is the kind of spot where you'd want to play him uh, because I think that the Bears are going to uh, kind of control the game. I, I think that the Jets are going to struggle on offense. Yeah, Jordan Howard, three point five yards per attempt, just really not, just not doing much. Uh, Alex, any Jordan Howard? Uh, I have him sprinkled a little bit through my lineups, but just a couple percent maybe uh, right now. By no means to see like a top play, but I think uh, you're not crazy if you want to have him. Uh, let's talk about one more spot, then we'll do our, our fades of the week and our contrarian picks to close this out. Also, before we do this last game uh, that we're going to cover straight away right now, make sure to throw the video a like. The likes help us out a lot. They've bumped the videos up the YouTube algorithm. More people get to see them. So it's like tipping your bartender. Please throw us that little that like. Click that thumbs up. We appreciate it. Subscribe to the channel, all that stuff. Uh, Russell Wilson going into Detroit to me is another one which seems underowned and like a pretty good matchup for Seattle. Seattle, I think, has been humming a little more, even though they don't. Uh, I'm not super inspired by Brian Schottenheimer as a as a coordinator in general, uh, but I think this matchup with Detroit sets up well for them. Evan, how do you see this game breaking down with Seattle and Detroit? Yeah. Um, well. Both of these teams are uh, have had really successful running games lately, and they they want to play run heavy football. Um, the Lions like they traded up for uh, Frank Ragnow, their their starting left guard in the draft, and then they traded up for Kerryon Johnson, a running back. You know, so they they had this certain like philosophy that they wanted to attack the off season with, and they're now they're really implementing it. Uh, their offensive line is number three in. Uh, uh, yards created before contact per rushing attempt, uh, just kicking butt. I mean, carrying on Johnson is like averaging like seven yards per carry. I mean, or something ridiculous, like dude is balling, um, no Theo Riddick again. So, you know, on, on that side, I mean, I think that sticking with carry on Johnson favorite at home, uh, again, no Riddick, you know, his, his playing time and his touches have gone up uh, three straight weeks entering this one. Uh, I mean, he deserves to be popular this week on the other side the the one concern that i have for seattle is um 
although they have been good in the running game, they have not been great in pass protection. Uh, no mm -hmm. surprise if you followed their history. And the Lions have been pretty good in terms of pass rush. Uh, so that is the, the one concern that I have for Seattle. Now, we are getting Russell Wilson off the bye. Um, and ideally, because uh, he dealt with a hamstring injury early in the season, ideally uh, he, he will come off the bye and be healthier and start running more. Um, but I think that, you know, throwing long touchdown bombs on low – pass attempts like he like he was kind of getting away with in the, the, the two games before the bye uh, that's going to be a little bit unsustainable on such low volume interesting uh, yeah I think that makes sense and uh, yeah the Russell Wilson's getting sacked about 10.3 percent of the time the Detroit defense happens to be stacking quarterbacks about 10.3 percent of the time so both of which would be highs on the slate so not a little bit of risk there and maybe some value for the Detroit defense even though it's in a, a tough spot uh, Alex, you were all over carry on Johnson last week. So let, let's get a victory lap there. Um, but what are you feeling about his prospects this week going against Seattle? I am not um, quite as much this week. There are a ton of other running backs that are in really good spots. So he's kind of fading into the pack for me. I think he's pretty playable though. I prefer going to the Detroit passing attack with Galladay and Golden Tate and Stafford. Uh, I think that's a pretty good stack. The problem is Seattle is pretty hard to pick one of the players to run it back with because uh, the usage is spread out pretty evenly through several different players. So uh, that's why it's not my favorite game stack, but I think that the Stafford stack uh, is definitely in play. I think Doug Baldwin got a little more on track in that London game, and I have some of them in the lineups I've made so far. Um, Evan, one question, uh, Golden Tate revenge narrative seems like a spiteful guy. I feel like this is his first actual game against Seattle, I think, since he's been healthy. Uh, any Golden Tate interest because of his spite and hate for Seattle? Yeah, it's his second one. Uh, but second the other game. one was like multiple years ago. So, and easy to forget because I think he had like three catches for 28 yeah, yards. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I like him all right. You know, he doesn't, doesn't really stand out. It's fair. Yeah, I look, I just want spiteful golden tape, but I think that makes sense if we're not going to go there. Uh, he is projected to have a fair bit of ownership as well, almost 15% for golden tape, so some risk there. Uh, let's talk about fades of the week. We've talked about a lot of players so far. Um, a lot of guys are going to have a ton of ownership. Alex, which of the guys who we project to have a ton of ownership do you think you will be running away from with, I guess, your, your hands over your ears or eyes? Let me pull up the ownership real quick here. So... I'm not as high on Kareem Hunt and James Conner as other running backs on the slate. Like I mentioned, Mixon is a big one, Lindsey. Uh, I think there's a lot of options you can go to there. So I think it makes sense to me if I'm going to go for a high price quarterback or a running back to get Gurley. And then uh, otherwise, I'm either going to try to find a more contrarian pick or a better value. Evan, how about you? Give me a fade of the week. I'm trying to think of someone here. Um, I don't know. I, I don't have the ownership numbers in front of me. Give, give me some names here. Uh, let's see. Patrick Mahomes expected to be one of the highest owned QBs. You got Goff picking up some ownership at QB. Running back, again, Hunt and Connor. And Gurley are the dudes wide receiver. I'm not giving you my wide receiver pick, but Jordy <laughs> Nelson up there. Uh, he is yeah. he is my picks. <laughs> Talk about that in a second. Um, Robert Woods also pretty high up there. Uh, let's see, yeah, that's all right. Cool. All right, I will go. Uh, I will go with Robert Woods. Ooh, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'll go with Jared Goff because I think that the Rams um, without Cooper cup who just gets so much scoring position usage, so many targets inside the 10, so many red zone targets, they just become that much more likely to uh, give the ball to Todd Gurley uh, when they're about to score. Um, and Jared Goff really, he has, he's had a couple of upside games, but just, you know, you, you need touchdowns from, he's not going to run, you know, he's not going to tack on extra fantasy points by running. Uh, so you need like a three or four touchdown game from him for sure. Uh, and with Todd Gurley just hogging all the, all the, the touchdowns, uh, that, that's difficult. And he's without his main uh, scoring position weapon. Um, again, I really, really like Brandon Cooks, though. 
Uh, and I think that he can have a big game. Are you buying the narrative that uh, that Sean McVay might want to get Todd Gurley the touchdown record this year? I mean, it's definitely like early to talk about that. You know, it, it definitely is early to start talking about that. We're seven games in. But he's on he's on pace to that's like a crazy record. Like I, mm-hmm. Ladanian Tomlinson, thirty one all purpose running back touchdowns. You know that may be a, a, a record that like never gets broken. I mean that that is an incredible number of touchdowns, man. I mean when we can get like twenty touchdowns these days, it's really special from a running back. Um, so I, I do think it would be a hell of an accomplishment. And when we see these teams that are you know, trying to chase records. Like we want to be on the right side of that. You remember 2014 Peyton Manning, you did not want to be fading Demarius Thomas, Eric Decker, Julius, Julius Thomas, and and Peyton Manning that year. You know, you wanted exposure to that offense every single week, if not just stacking the offense every single week, that would have paid major, major dividends. Um, So I, I, I'm not sure about it, but I do think that it can uh, start to really become a reality. Uh, And in the meantime, like, I think that they're going to keep, feeding him certainly as long as Cooper cup is out. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense to me. And I, I think, yeah, it is a little premature, but you know, you do see Sean McVay and he does seem like a guy who likes to give his guys a chance to, to achieve their maximum potential. And I think having that one in his stead, it's, it's crazy in this world of running backs by committee that Gurley could even potentially break that record to get close to it, but fun to see. And hopefully, hopefully they, they fight for that a little more. Could also be fine for the undefeated year. Who knows? These are Rams. Um, yeah, my fade of the week is, is Jordy Nelson for the reasons I think that you can guess. He's just not getting separation the way I like. I think Martavis Bryant is a smarter play. I think Seth Roberts is a smarter play. Um, I, you know, I get why I go in there. And if you were like 5% owned, sure. But 20% for, for Jordy Nelson, I'm good. I'm good, Jordy. You have fun out there. You have, you have a great time, Derek Carr. Um, let's talk about our contrarian picks. We'll go through all of the main positions. Alex, your contrarian QB for the week, who you would stake your life on if you had to. Stake my life on a contrarian pick, man. What are you asking me to do here? <laughs> There's a really, uh, really fervent hostage taker who loves fantasy sports. That's what like I assume happens there. <laughs> so uh, I do like Alex Smith potentially, but he's a little bit too contrary and I might not go there. Uh, so I'll go with Matthew Stafford at 3% ownership. I think that any week he's in the conversation to have a really good performance just because Detroit passes so much. Um, so I think that his potential is pretty good. He's uh, about 50, uh, in the median price of quarterbacks, and I really like how concentrated the targets are between Gallaudet and Tate. So I think that you can build a pretty good game stack on those guys. Evan, how about you? Contrarian QB pick. Yeah, Derek Anderson. I think he's going to throw for like five touchdowns. On, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Look, I, was on, I was on Derek Anderson last week, and he looked okay for like one or two drives. And then, <laughs> <laughs> then he realized he wanted to be on the golf course. He had enough. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, that's, that's hilarious. Uh, he came out of that game injured, too. Like he's got back and knee injuries. <laughs> I mean, he was literally playing golf every day. (laughs) He's he's not ready for that. (laughs) Right. He's not ready for that. I'm going to go with Derek Carr. I mean, people are on Jordy Nelson. People Mm -hmm. are on Jared Cook. People are on Martavis Bryant. People are on Jalen Richard. You know, this game could definitely shoot out. Um, Derek Carr is cheap, man. You Mm -hmm. know, and we got over 50 point total. Um, So. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna make one t- at least one tournament lineup with uh, Derek Carr, probably probably stacking him with Jared Cook, bringing it back with I don't know somebody on the Colts. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, he is very cheap. He is only 5,200 on DraftKings and under three percent ownership projected. Uh, for me, I'm gonna go Russell Wilson. I think I like Andrew Luck a little more, but his ownership is about three times as much as uh, Russell Wilson. Uh, but Wilson's very low. Um, and I think he just looked better. He's, it seems like they're rounding into form in a way. And Baldwin in particular, I thought, looked really good in that London game. Was targeted more. I think he's set to kind of have his role increase. Uh, so I like him. Uh, Evan, how about a contrarian running back? Uh, contrarian running back. Um, we will go with uh, – hmm. I'll go with Trent Cannon. I mean, hey, you had him at 1%. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that Jeremy Bates, the OC there, really likes him. Uh, I liked what I saw from him in the preseason. If you just look at spark ratings for running backs that were drafted in 2018, it's Saquon Barkley, number one, Trenton Cannon, number two. I mean, he's a really explosive player. 
um, led the team in receiving last week. You know, I don't think that Isaiah Crowell is going to have a lot of success, and I think they're going to be playing from behind. So um, I'm going to go with Trenton Cannon. Alex, how about you, contrarian running back? I'll go with Devontae Booker playing at Kansas City. Uh, it's pretty likely they're going to be in a big hole, and Devontae Booker is probably going to be their pass catching back uh, uh, in a game where they're playing from behind. And the price is only 3700 on DraftKings, so I think there's some potential there, and I especially like it in a game stack with uh, Mahomes. Interesting. I will go – so you guys went really contrarian. I'm going to go less contrarian because I did my pick in advance. Uh, David Johnson is the one I'm going to go with. Uh, he's, he's contrarian compared to the Connors and Hunts and uh, Gurley's of the world. But, again, I, I really believe in Byron Leftwich. I've always loved Byron Leftwich since I was a kid, and this might be biasing me a little bit. Uh, when he hurt his leg and he kept playing and he had, like, a torn ACL or whatever and just gutted it out. And he's just always been a quarterback I loved in video games. And he was, you know, he was in part of the black quarterback boom but didn't run. I just, I just respect Byron Leftwich a lot. Um, and I think he's smart. And I think he being under Bruce Arians, I also think is a very smart guy. And I think Mike McCoy is the, one of the worst coordinators in the league. And, I just, it's like going from, you know, a boss who you was a genius to a boss who was just like a middle manager type who had no clue what he was doing was like going from Arians to McCoy. I think getting Leftwich in there is going to be a game saver for that team. And I'm David Johnson, ride or die. Chris, I got a channel, a wise man named Josh Engelman here and say, are you getting points for what Byron Leftwich did like 10 years ago? You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, like Byron to me, I just, I've always liked Byron. He's got a great smile. <laughs> he's, got, he's got a good vibe about him. And I just think he's smart. And I think that McCoy was so bad. I mean, again, this is my logic for Derek Anderson last week was you, you take out a three quarterback and put in a, maybe a four quarterback and then it'll improve a little. Um, I don't know. I just, I just think left, is smart. And I think he's part of that generation where he's been in offenses that were wide open. So I'll, I'll pray, but David Johnson, Alex, in, in your algorithm, um, you know, where, where do you put, uh, like, do you, do you factor in uh, smile points? Like, <laughs> smile? <laughs> and offensive coordinators who have a great smile are known to be more successful. I'm sure there's many data points. Sean McVay, great smile. Think about it. True. Think- <laughs> Very true. I'm going to have uh, Alex, to update my model this week if, uh, <laughs> if they go off. <laughs> if you want me to give offensive coordinators smile rankings for you, Alex, I can do that. That's I'm here for you. <laughs> contrarian wide receiver pick Alex to close it out I would say Martavis Bryant but he is looking pretty uh on that 10 percent so let me go down here I would allow that I think that's fair he's super cheap I think that I think under 10 percent and 3700 that seems fair okay let me just do a check here. I'll you go want to dig deeper, though, I respect it. I'll pick Kenny Gada. He's been having crazy, like, statistical year this year. And at 7%, I think he has a uh, pretty high upside for the price. Uh, what about you, having contrarian wide receiver to close it out? Yeah, Galladay is interesting, too, because he keeps getting touchdowns pulled off the board. You know, he's mm. just been on the really the negative side of variance recently. Um, I just had a good one and totally forgot it. Um, I was going to say maybe Seth Roberts, um, mm-hmm. but I, I, you know, but I don't think his smile is good enough. So I'm going to go with Antonio <laughs> Callaway. Uh, can't catch, but man, is he handsome. I mean, he's <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but he last week he had uh, he ran 35 routes, uh, second most among Browns receivers. Hugh Jackson says he needs to get the ball more, which you know Hugh Jackson always delivers on those promises. Um, and I mean he's he's got to start catching the ball at some point, right? <laughs> he, he really he gets a lot of opportunity. He didn't last week, but he has over the course of the season. I mean he's had games where he has like 10 targets and two catches, you know. Um, but Again, the, the opportunity is going to be there for him. Uh, I think the Browns are going to be playing from behind against Pittsburgh. And uh, he's, he's explosive, albeit an, an, an amazing underachiever uh, relative to his, uh, his opportunity so far. But hopefully, hopefully he can catch the balls that are thrown to him this week. And again, he's very, very cheap, as he should be. Um, I'll give my, this is not my pick, but I just want to talk because you weren't here last week. So you missed the, the Damian Ratley, the Ratman hype 
that was sweeping the nation and mostly me. Um, Damian Ratley, is he a better player than Antonio Cowley? Because I think he is by a pretty decent stretch. Maybe. I mean, it's it's in play. Antonio Callaway, like, didn't play football in 2017. So imagine being, you know, a 21-year-old dude, and you're playing in the NFL after not playing the sport. You're playing at the highest level possible. You didn't even play the sport the year before. You know, so he's got to work through some things. You know, there, there's no, no question. Um, I'm not ready to make a, a definitive statement on what kind of a player Antonio Callaway is. It's no surprise any time that a rookie receiver really struggles, um, you know, especially, and then you really adjust for what, what he has gone, gone through or, you know, kind of put himself through just, you know, being immature and making mistakes, you know, as, as we all have. Um, but, I mean, just not playing football – and then playing in the NFL the next year is that's quite a leap. And, and it, they've asked a lot of him uh, and he's really kind of hurt the team so far, but they, they keep running him out there and um, he's going to keep continue to get opportunities. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I, you know, watch the rat man this week, watch him be this be the week he goes off after I touted him to high heavens last week. Uh, but I, I'm rooting for Damian Riley. He's not my pick though. My pick is to Sean Jackson. Um, I, I get the, the target concerns and all that, but I think he hasn't had that big game with Jameis Winston yet. I think Terrell Austin defenses get beaten deep a lot. Um, just, and that's more of an anecdotal thing than a statistical thing, but I just don't like this Bengals defense at all. And I think that Tampa Bay is going to have their way with them. I think Deshaun at under 5% ownership, knowing what his upside is, is that's a spot where I want to be on. Uh, so that's my guy. And that's it for us this week. Uh, any parting words, Evan or Alex? Yeah, uh, just thanks uh, everyone for watching. Thanks, Evan, again for uh, for being on the show. You're the expert, so it's really good uh, hearing when uh, when you're on the same place as me. And then if you're not, I mean, I gotta reevaluate. And then Chris, uh, thanks for hosting as always. And I brought the smile matrix to the table this week, which was going to be a premium Osmo.com feature <laughs> from book code contrary. We're going to be rating smiles left and right of coordinators and players. <laughs> you can't get this information anywhere else except Osmo.com. No, no, you literally cannot. <laughs> uh, but that's it for us this week. Thank you guys for watching promo code contrary at Osmo.com. will get you premium access for a week free. So go sign up now and do that. Throw the video a like, subscribe to the channel, follow Evan Silva, follow at Osmo DFS, follow Chris Spags on Twitter. And uh, we'll see you guys again soon. Thank you guys for watching. Good luck.